In this lecture video, we'll talk about what is matter and energy. We'll focus on what is matter, what are different states of matter, um, how do you define matter, what are different properties of matter, and same thing with energy. Okay, so let's begin first with uh, defining matter. What is matter? Matter is essentially defined as anything that would occupy space or that has a mass, which means that anything that you can find around us can be classified into a type of matter. For instance, if we are drinking orange juice for breakfast, that is matter. The water that we use, that is matter. The water that you uh, put in a cup, that cup is also an example of a matter. Basically, anything that you touch, that you're using, that you can smell, that you inhale, air, everything is a type of matter. So for instance, the aluminum can that the cold ring comes in, uh, that is a type of matter. And so scientists basically regard everything as matter. There are different types of matter and we can classify matter into different types and we'll look at that later on. But basically matter is com composed of a lot of tiny little pieces or tiny little particles. These are called as atoms or molecules. Atoms are essentially something uh, that is a pure element. Okay, I will talk about the definition of element later on and then atoms and molecules be will become more clear. But essentially everything, every matter that you see is composed of tiny little pieces which is called atoms or molecules. For instance, in a room, everything you can see, you can touch, smell, taste is made up of matter. Basically, chemists study the differences in matter and how these is related to the structure of matter. What are the properties? What affects matter? And how we can control uh, different states of matter? Okay, so to understand this, first we'll try to understand what are the different types of matter that exist. So matter can be classified into two different types, two major categories. First one is called a pure substance. Pure means, like the name suggests, it's a pure substance. It is always composed of just one type of thing. Okay. It's completely pure. The second kind of matter is called a mixture. Okay? Pure substances can further be classified into two categories, which is elements and compounds. And mixtures can also be classified into two categories, which is a homogeneous mixture or a heterogeneous mixture. Okay, let's see what each of them actually mean. So what is a pure substance? A pure substance, by definition, is essentially a type of matter that has the fixed that is fixed and definite composition. Okay? So which means that it would always consist of this composition. It's a pure substance. It cannot be mixed up of a couple different things. It's pure in itself. Okay? It has a definite composition. You can find this pure substance from anywhere in the world. It will always consist of the same composition. Okay? So the two types of pure substances that exist are elements and compounds. What is an element? An element is basically the simplest type of a pure substance. It is composed of only one type of material. Okay, it will only consist of one type of atom. For instance, if let's say if I'm talking about copper, you can see right here, this copper uh, composition is it only consists of one type of atom, which is copper. You have an aluminum can that would always consist of one type of element, which is aluminum. If I have an iron uh, bicycle, let's say I have an iron rod that would always consist of only one kind of atom, which is iron. Iron is written as Fe. Okay? So elements essentially are always composed of only one type of element. And these elements are composed of the smallest particle that can be then broken into is atom. Okay? All these elements are composed of Atoms. These are tiny, tiny little particles that make up each type of matter. Okay. Next type of pure substance is called a compound. A compound is also a pure substance, but it consists of atoms of two or more elements, which is always combined in the same proportion. What does that mean? That meaning, for instance, if we take an example of water. What is water? Water, chemically, it is composed of two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. So this is an example of a compound now. It will, you can pick water from wherever in this world. If it is pure water, meaning if it is not mixed up with anything, if it is pure water, that would always consist of two 
atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. So chemically, it is pure. Chemically, it is always consist of this composition. The proportion in which the atoms are combined are same. So the major difference between an element and a compound is that element consists of only one type of atom and compounds consist of more than two, two or more than two kinds of atoms. Okay, but the, what is the common element between the element and compound? The common part is that both of them are pure. So for instance, if I say hydrogen gas, hydrogen gas is H2. It consists of only one type of atom, which is H, hydrogen atom. So you can take hydrogen gas from wherever in this world, as long as it is pure hydrogen, it will be H2 chemically. Same thing with compounds. You saw an example of water. You can take an example of salt, okay? Table salt, NaCl, okay? NaCl is always composed of two atoms. One is Na, one is Cl. And they are always in this proportion, meaning you can pick sodium chloride from wherever, whichever part in this world as long as it is a pure sodium chloride, it will always consist of one atom of sodium and one atom of chlorine. These atoms are chemically interacting with each other, okay? So, which means that these, in a compound, you cannot separate the atoms or the individual elements from each other until, unless you try to use a chemical process, which means you cannot just physically uh, take sodium and chloride so take sodium chloride and just separate sodium and chlorine atom okay? this cannot be just physically it's not physically possible but chemically you can separate them okay so that is another important thing in compounds the elements are combined together in a certain proportion and they are combined by a chemical process which means in order to separate them you have to use a chemical process as well for instance, water, you cannot just take water and separate it into hydrogen and oxygen. In order to separate water into hydrogen and oxygen, you have to use a chemical process, okay? That is pure substance. Now, what is a mixture? The next type of uh, uh, matter that we talked about was a mixture. A mixture is essentially a type of matter that consists of two or more substances that are mixed together, but only physically mixed together meaning there is no chemical interaction between them. They are not chemically combined. They are only physically mixed together, okay? And another important thing or difference between a compound and a mixture, how would you separate a compound and a mixture? A compound is first thing, the elements are chemically combined. In a mixture, the uh, substance or the elements are only combined physically. The second thing is that in case of a compound, you could not separate the elements in by a physical method you need to have a chemical process to separate them whereas in case of a mixture the two or more substances can be separated by physical process or physical method physical process basically means just using let's say filtration okay sieving for instance a mixture of spaghetti and water can be separated using a strainer that is a physical process, okay? If I give you a mixture of coins, for instance, nickels, quarters, um, different types of coins, and I ask you to separate, okay, nickels out of all of the rest of the coins, you could physically separate it. So that is an example of a mixture where you can physically separate the substances from each other, okay? Another important difference between a mixture and a compound is that in case of a compound, the substances that are mixed together or the elements that are mixed together are always mixed in a certain proportion the proportion is always fixed for instance we saw h2o it will always be 2h and 1o but in case of mixture the proportion in which these substances two or more substances are mixed can be different okay for instance if we are making a mixture between spaghetti and water you could have more spaghetti sometimes sometimes we could have more water right so that is an example of a mixture because the composition is not fixed. So that is how you can differentiate between a mixture and a compound. A compound would always have the same composition and it is a chemically mixed substance. Okay, so the chemicals are basically interacting with each other. So you need to use a chemical process to separate them into elements. In a mixture, they are just interacting with each other by a physical process. They are just physically mixed together. So you could easily separate them by physical processes as well.
Now, mixture can be classified further down into two categories. One is called a homogeneous mixture. The second is called a heterogeneous mixture. What is a homogeneous mixture? By definition, a homogeneous mixture is a mixture where the composition is uniform throughout the sample. What does that mean? For instance, let's say if I take a, if I take a cup of water and I add some NaCl into it. So now this is a salt solution. Okay. What would happen? The salt, which is sodium chloride, would dissolve in water, right? So now this has become a salt solution. Now you can take a spoon out of this salt solution. As long as it is completely dissolved, you take a spoon out of the salt solution. That spoon is going to taste, smell exactly the same as the rest of the solution that is present in the cup. Okay? So that means it's a homogeneous mixture. You can pick a spoon out of it right now. You can take a spoon out of this solution two days later, as long as it is closed, it is going to have the same composition, meaning it would have the same amount of water and it would have the same amount of salt every single time. So that is an example of a homogeneous mixture where the composition is uniform throughout the sample. Okay. Another example is brass. Brass is a mixture. It's a homogeneous mixture of copper and zinc. So if you have a brass, a pure brass substance, it's going to have the same amount of copper atoms and the same amount of zinc atoms every single time. That is a homogeneous mixture. The different part, uh, the other uh, part, uh, characteristic of a homogeneous mixture is that different parts of the mixture are not visible, which means that if I have a salt solution, you cannot see where the salt is and where the water is. Okay, It's basically now a combined mixture. You cannot see the salt and you cannot see water they are not visible to you same thing with brass if you're looking at brass you cannot just simply say oh this part is copper or this part is zinc it's very homogeneously mixed together so you cannot visibly see the two different parts or two different components of a homogeneous mixture on the other hand a heterogeneous mixture is a mixture where the composition varies from one part of the mixture to another for instance here if you have some copper or let's say some coins mixed in water. Okay? The coins are going to settle down and the water is going to be up top on the, in that particular glass, right? Or that container. So here, this is a mixture because it consists of two components, but this mixture is very heterogeneous. For instance, if I pick, uh, take a spoon and just pick the top portion out of this mixture, it's only going to give me water. Whereas if I go further down into this, cup and try to drag some copper out of it that's when I can get some maybe a coin and some water into it so every single time you try to pick out some component or some part of this heterogeneous mixture out it's going to give you different composition for instance if you mix another cup if I mix some sand and water right you know that sand is not going to dissolve in water it's not going to mix in sand at some point is going to settle down, right? So you could mix this together, uh, swirl it around, shake it so that it's a very homogeneous mixture. And now you can take a spoon out of it and then maybe wait another minute and then take another spoon out of it. You know that the composition in the two spoons that you got from this water and sand mixture is not going to be same. So that essentially means it's a heterogeneous mixture. The composition of one part of this mixture is going to be different from the other part of this mixture. Okay. And the other difference is that the different parts of these mixtures are visible. For instance, here, if you have sand and water, you can easily distinguish between water and sand because they don't mix very well together. Same thing here. You can easily see where is water and where is copper. So that is an example of a heterogeneous mixture. Now let's do a couple of questions. To check if we understand what we are doing here, identify each of the following as a pure substance or as a mixture. So pasta and tomato sauce, that is an example of a mixture. And why is that? Because again, the composition here is not going to be very uniform. Okay. One, it's a heterogeneous mixture. And second, it's a mixture because every single time you could mix pasta with tomato sauce, but you cannot have the same composition or the same amount of pasta and same amount of tomato every single time. Okay. 
Next is aluminum foil. Aluminum foil is a pure substance. Why? Because it is only composed of aluminum, which is one type of element. Okay. Helium is also a pure substance. Helium gas is only composed of He, which is helium by itself, which is an element. So it's a pure substance. Air. Air is a mixture. Air is a mixture of multiple kinds of gases. For instance, there's oxygen, there's nitrogen, there's some hydrogen, there is some CO2, there is some helium. It is basically a mixture of multiple different types of gases which are just physically present together. They are not chemically interacting. For instance, oxygen is not chemically interacting with nitrogen. This is just different gases combined together to form air. So air is essentially an example of a mixture. Okay, next we'll talk about another way of classifying matter, which is basically classifying matter on based on their physical state. So physical state essentially means it can be solid, liquid, or gas. These are just called different states of matter or different states in which matter can exist meaning a matter can be either solid it can be liquid or it can be gas now what is the difference between solid liquid and gases you probably already know this in the general language let's say if we take an example of water water can exist as solid which we call as ice it can exist as liquid which we usually refer to as liquid water and it can also exist as gas which we usually call as water vapor so those are just different states of matter. That is an example of water. Water is an example of matter, and this is the different states it can exist in. Similarly, every matter can exist in different states. Okay, One of the states could be preferred over the other, but basically it can exist in all three different states. Now, what is the chemically, what is the difference between solid, liquid, and gas, and what makes them solid, liquid, and gas? Here you can see in the Im image above, this is solid, liquid, and then gas. Solid essentially means where the atoms or the molecules or the particles that compose the matter are very tightly or compactly arranged. Okay, so there is literally no gap between these atoms. They are very tightly packed around each other. If we talk about their shape, it's a fixed shape. For instance, if we you have probably have a pen in your hand right now, that is a solid. You cannot change the shape of that pen without bending it, without breaking it apart. So solids have a fixed shape. Volume is also fixed for them because you cannot change the volume. Volume basically means the space that they occupy. You cannot change the space they occupy until unless you break it apart into two pieces. Solids cannot be compressed, right? You could take a book, try to shrink it, okay, maybe reduce your course load, but it's not going to happen. It's a solid, so you cannot shrink, you cannot compress a solid. Flow, similarly solids do not flow. You place a solid somewhere, as long as the surface is straight, it's not going to flow. Okay, why is that? Because again, the atoms or molecules are very closely and compactly arranged with each other. In case of a liquid though, you can see right here, there is some space between the atoms. It's not a lot, but there is also, there's still some space between the atoms and the atoms are moving around in this particular space. They do have when we talk about shape, they do have an indefinite shape. Indefinite essentially means that it would take up the shape of whatever container you place them in. For instance, liquid, water. If I take water, I place it into a cup, it's going to take the shape of the cup. If I take the same amount of liquid and put it into a bottle, it's going to take the shape of that bottle. So their shape is indefinite, it's not fixed. Their volume, though, is fixed, which meaning if I have a cup of water, it's going to be a cup of water until unless I add or Take some water out of that. They cannot be compressed, meaning you cannot just take a cup of water and try to squeeze it into a really tiny cup. It's not going to happen, right? So you cannot compress liquid. Flow, yes, they do flow. Flow means that the liquid essentially flows. If you will drop it, it's going to flow together, right? Gases, on the other hand, you can see right here, the atoms or the molecules are very far apart from each other, meaning there is a lot of space between them. These molecules or atoms are like crazily moving around in the space that you give them. So when it comes to their shape, they also have an indefinite shape, meaning they do not have a shape of their own. They are going to take up the shape of the container they are placed in. The difference here is majorly with the volume of the gases. Gases can occupy any volume 
that they are placed into. So if, the, if I take a certain amount of gas, let's say these 10 molecules of gas, and I put them into a mm, container, a uh, small bottle, it's going to take the uh, entire volume of that bottle. And if I now take it and put it into a very big cylinder, those 10 molecules are going to take up the volume of that container, how they're going to just move around and separate. The gap between these molecules is just going to increase. So when it comes to volume, gases have no volume. They'll occupy the volume of container. They'll occupy the shape of the container they're placed in. Can be compressed gases? Yes. What does that mean? For instance, you would probably, you might have probably heard of like helium containers, right? Which is used to fill up certain balloons. So uh, cylinders, those cylinders or containers, they basically have compressed gas. You could take up because there's so much space, empty space between different gas molecules or atoms. You can easily compress and push these atoms or molecules to come together, reducing the space between them. So you could compress gases. Similarly, the gases also flow because, again, they like to um, separate from each other. They like to have enough space so they can also flow. Now, the next thing which comes to our uh, commonly used in chemistry are different properties of matter. Now, matter can one is a physical property and the other type of property is called as the chemical properties. So what are physical properties? The properties of the characteristics that are observed or measured without changing the identity of the substance, meaning we are not changing the identity of that particular compound. That is a physical property. For instance, when we talk about a uh, physical state of a substance, like uh, something is solid, water is solid, water is liquid, water is gas. Here we are only talking about its physical property. How does water exist? The original substance in all these states is still water. We are not changing the identity of the substance. Water can be solid, liquid, gas. It's basically its physical property. It can exist as solid, liquid, or gas. For instance, shape of a substance, color of a substance, all these are physical properties. It's boiling point, it's freezing point. When I say boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius, that is its physical property. It does not change the identity of the substance. It is still water. Its freezing point is zero degrees Celsius. There is a difference between these two properties, but they do not change the identity of the substance. Another physical property that you'll commonly see or you have seen in the previous topic is density of a substance that is also associated with the identity of the substance for instance water has a density of one gram per cubic centimeter it is if as long as something has this density it is supposed to be water okay, so that depends on its physical on its identity no change is made to its identity similarly there are some changes when we talk about in chemistry. Some changes are called as physical change. Some changes are called as chemical change. So what is a physical change? A physical change occurs when matter undergoes a physical change of state, but its composition remains the same or it remains constant. So essentially, it's the same thing. If we are just changing the physical property of a, mole of a molecule of a substance, that change is called a physical change. If the identity of the substance remains the same, it is a physical substance. As long as we are not changing the composition of the material or its chemical properties, it is a physical change. For instance, again, water can exist in three different states, ice, water, or steam, or water vapor. These are just different physical states or physical um, states of water. If I change from ice, if I melt ice into water, which is liquid, and if I heat this liquid up to form steam or water vapor, what am I doing here? I'm doing a physical change. It is not a chemical change. Since here also the identity of the substance is what H2O, here also it's H2O in form of steam also it's H2O. As long as the chemical composition stays constant, it is a physical change. The next type of property and the type of change is called a chemical property or a chemical change. So chemical properties describe the ability of a substance to interact with other substances and to change into a new substance. So whenever a property affects the or describes the ability of a substance to change into a completely new substance, meaning the chemical composition, that is called a chemical property.
Similarly, what is a chemical change? A chemical change is when the original substance is turned into one or more new substance with new physical and new phys chemical properties. So essentially, we are changing the composition of a substance during this change. That change is called a chemical change. Here are some examples of physical changes and chemical changes. For instance, when water boils, we already saw if it boils and forms water vapor, this is also H2O, this is also H2O. So it's a physical change. When copper is drawn into thin copper wires, if this is also copper, this in wire is also copper. Copper is written as Cu. So the chemical composition here has not changed. When we dissolve sugar in water, in presence in when it is solid sugar, that is also chemically it is sugar. When it is dissolved in water, it is still sugar, right? So that means the chemical composition has not changed. Therefore, it's a physical change. If a paper is cut into tiny pieces of confetti, this chemically it is paper. When it is turned into confetti, that is still chemically it is still paper. So this, all these changes are physical changes. Whereas if we talk about a chemical change, for instance, if you take iron, and we put it outside. It is iron by itself is very gray. It is gray and shiny, right? But if you leave it outside for too long, it is going to combine with air, specifically oxygen in the air to form orange rust. rust. So iron changes into rust. That is a chemical change. Here, iron is present as Fe. Here, chemically, after this change, it is turned into iron oxide, okay? So this is a completely different chemical. Therefore, it is called a chemical change. If we heat sugar up, it forms a smooth caramel colored substance. That is an example of a chemical change. Why? Because you took sugar and you heated it up. Now it has changed into a completely different substance. Its color has changed. When the color changes, usually that's an indicator of a chemical change. A piece of wood burns with a bright flame and produces heat, ashes, carbon dioxide, water vapor. So this is a chemical change or a chemical reaction. We started with wood and we heated it up, right? So heat essentially, you could put the symbol, uh, which means it's heat. When we heat it up, it changed into ash, it changed into CO2, it changed into water vapor, right? All of this, and it also produced some energy, which is heat. So it started, we started with this and we are ending up with something that is this. So chemically, everything has changed. It's no longer wood. So this is a chemical change. Similarly, if we have shiny silver metal, it reacts in air to produce a black grainy coating. So silver usually gets like black after a little bit, which basically is a chemical change. So silver is reacting again with air or oxygen to produce something else, which is chemically a different composition. So it's a chemical change. Similarly, you can see the difference between different properties, which is physical properties, chemical properties, what is the actual difference, okay? Now we'll talk about the next important thing in chemistry, which is called the law, which is called the law of conservation of mass or matter. What does this law state? This law states that matter cannot be created or destroyed in a chemical reaction, which means law of conservation of mass or conservation of matter. That essentially means that matter is always conserved. You cannot create new matter. You cannot destroy matter that exists. That is not possible. In this world, whatever matter is present, it can only change form from one state of matter to other state of matter. It can go from one substance to another substance, but the amount or the mass or the amount of matter that is present is always going to be same. Which means, let's say, if there is a reaction where some reactants are getting converted into products. Okay? So in this case, the total mass of the reactant will always be equal to the total mass of products. Why? Because law of conservation of matter or law of conservation of mass. You cannot destroy it. You cannot create new. Only thing we can do is we can change its form. It can go from one type of substance to other type of substance, but you cannot destroy it or you cannot just make something new up. For instance, if I take this butane gas, which is present usually, this is the gas that is present in lighters. So if we take some gas and butane of butane gas in a lighter, let's say 58 grams of butane in a lighter, and we react it 
with oxygen. Oxygen is in the air. Around 208 grams of oxygen, it is going to produce some products which is carbon dioxide and water. So it is going to produce 176 grams of carbon dioxide and 90 grams of water, meaning you started with total amount of reactant was 58 plus 208, which is 266 grams of reactants. You should end up with the same amount of product. It could be different amounts of each product, but as long as the total amount of reactant and total amount of product is same, your mass is conserved. And that should always be same in any given chemical reaction, physical reaction, it does not matter. The next very important uh, unit uh, that you're going to see very commonly used in chemistry and that affects the properties of matter a lot is temperature. Temperature is basically a measure of how hot or how cold an object is compared to another object, right? It is usually measured using the thermometer and is usually reported in uh, Celsius in science, okay? This is degree Celsius, but there are some more um, units of temperature. For instance, there is Fahrenheit, there is Kelvin. Kelvin is a very common unit that is used in chemistry. Okay? Fahrenheit is usually commonly used in uh, US. Celsius is a unit that is usually used at uh, other places in the world. So uh, when we talk about converting between temperature you could use different conversion factors to go from one temperature to other temperature okay so what is the relationship that relates degree celsius to degree fahrenheit you could use this conversion factor so temperature this is temperature in fahrenheit is equal to 1.8 times temperature in degree celsius plus 32 so this is the equation again you don't have to memorize it i will probably give you this equation in uh, the exam okay now in order to obtain degree celsius from fahrenheit we can rearrange this equation meaning if i take both the sides and i subtract 32 on both the sides and i divide both the sides by 1.8 that would give me this equation for instance let's rewrite this i have tf equals 1.8 i'm just going to rearrange the equation okay plus 32. This temperature is in degree Celsius, Tc. Tf means temperature is in Fahrenheit. So what I would do is I will subtract 32 on both the sides because I want to figure out what is Tc. Okay, if you solve, this is just normal, simple algebra. This would kind of give you a review of algebra. So let's say I'm trying to solve for Tc. So what does that mean? I want Tc on one side of the equal and rest everything else should be on the other side of the equal. Right. So basically, I want to move whatever is here to that side of the equal. So I have 32 right here. It's a plus. So I'm going to do minus 32 on both the sides of the equal, which means you cannot just add 32 or subtract 32 on one side. You have to do it on both the sides. Okay. So what would happen here? This 32 and this 32 will get canceled. It would turn zero because it's plus and minus. This would be the TF minus 32. Now. What's left on this side? I have 1.8 times Tc. So in order to get rid of this 1.8, I'll divide this side by 1.8. And if I'm dividing this side, I have to divide the other side as well, which means I get this. So 1.8 and 1.8 gets canceled. What am I left here? I'm left with Tc on one side, which is exactly what I wanted. So Tc is equal to Tf minus 32 divided by 1.8. I will be giving you this equation an exam essentially or um, and then you can use this equation to solve for temperature in degree celsius okay so if you're solving for temperature in degree celsius if temperature in degree celsius is given to you and the question is asking what is fahrenheit basically you can rearrange this equation to go from degree celsius to fahrenheit or you can use this equation up here okay so if needed you can go between the units and this is the conversion factor you use for okay for instance, you could try this question. The typical temperature in a room is 21 degrees Celsius. What is that temperature in degrees Fahrenheit? So the question is giving me the temperature, which is 21 degrees Celsius. So temperature in degrees Celsius is given to me 21 degrees Celsius. The question is asking, what is the temperature in Fahrenheit? To make this conversion, I need a conversion factor, and we know 
that the temperature in Fahrenheit is equal to 1.8 times the temperature in degree Celsius plus 32. So we will first solve. This is actual parentheses, okay? 1.8 times Tc plus 32. So you can basically just plug in the value of Tc here. So it is going to be 1.8 times 21 degrees Celsius plus 32. So always remember whenever there's multiplication given to you in question, it's multiplication and addition, you always solve for multiplication. Okay, remember this. You always do multiplication first, then followed by addition. So we'll solve for 1.8 times 21 first. If you plug this into your calculator, it is going to give you 37.8 plus 32. And if you plug this into your calculator, that is going to give you 69.8, meaning now this is Fahrenheit, so it would be degree Fahrenheit. Now, you have to think of sig figs when you give the final answer. How many sig figs do we have given to us in temp TC? Two sig figs. This is two sig figs. How many sig figs are in 32? We don't care about sig figs here. Why? Because it's an exact number. Same thing, 1.8 is an exact number. This is given to us in conversion factor. Remember, whatever the conversion factors, you'd never consider their sig figs. So the number of sig figs we want in our final answer, in this case, is going to be done in two steps. Meaning, you have 21 degrees Celsius right here. That is two sig figs. So this right here should have how many final sig figs in this final answer? Two, okay, which would end right here. Now, when we talk about converting it into the uh, Fahrenheit, the sig figs that we have is ending right here. So how many sig figs are in 32? We don't care. So your final answer should have two sig figs, which would give us in this, the following digit after the number of Final number of sig figs is 8, which is greater than 5, which means we will round this number up to 70 degree Fahrenheit. Okay. Next, we'll talk about another scale of temperature, which is Kelvin. So Kelvin, as I said, is another unit of temperature used by scientists. Now, the coldest temperature that is possible or in this world that can exist is minus 273 degree Celsius. And this temperature on Kelvin scale is called the absolute zero Kelvin temperature, okay? So that means that minus 273 degree Celsius, oh, 273 degree Celsius is equal to zero Kelvin. It's regarded as the absolute zero temperature in Kelvin scale. So basically that means that I can rearrange this equation to give us this conversion factor. So you can use this, this conversion factor to convert between temperature given to you in Kelvin and degree Celsius. So temperature in Tk stands for temperature in Kelvin and Tc stands for temperature in degree Celsius. So Tk will be equal to Tc plus 273. You can use this conversion factor to convert between different temperatures. So now one important thing is that on Kelvin scale, the lowest temperature that is possible is absolute zero. The world does not exist after absolute zero. So there are no negative temperatures on Kelvin scale. The smallest or the lowest temperature possible is zero Kelvin. Okay. How will we use this conversion factor? So for instance, what is the normal body, body temperature of 37 degrees Celsius in Kelvin? You could basically go from the temperature the question is asking, what is this temperature in Kelvin? So you can use the conversion factor. We know that Tk is equal to Tc plus 273. Tk is the temperature in Kelvin that I'm solving for. What is Tc? Tc is the temperature in degree Celsius. It's given to us in question is 37 degrees Celsius plus 273. If you solve for this, your calculator would give you the final answer as 310. Kelvin. Okay, so our final answer is going to be 310 Kelvin. Okay.
the next important concept we'll talk about now is energy. So energy is defined as the ability to do work. So if we have energy, we can do work. Uh, no energy means no work can be done. So energy can be classified into two different forms. One is called kinetic energy. The other one is called potential energy. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. So that means essentially if anything is in motion, it has kinetic energy. A ball that is rolling on the floor has kinetic energy. Uh, an apple that is falling from the tree has kinetic energy. Anything that is in motion is has some kinetic energy. The other form of energy is potential energy, which is uh, the energy that is present in an object because of its position or because of its chemical composition. So, for instance, if you have a book which is present on a tabletop, that book, if it is not in motion, if it is just staying still, it has some potential energy. Why is that? Because of its height, because of its position, because of its chemical composition, it has some potential energy. The next law is related to energy is the law of conservation of energy. This law is very similar to the law that we saw before. It tells you that energy is always conserved, which means that energy cannot be created. It cannot be destroyed. The total amount of energy in the universe is always constant. You cannot increase or decrease the energy. Only thing we can do is we can transfer the energy from one place to another. We can change the form of the energy that it is in, meaning you can change between kinetic energy and potential energy, but you cannot create or destroy energy. For instance, if we take example of this reservoir, water in the reservoir behind the dam, which is still, has some potential energy. Why? Because of its position. It's at a height. It has some potential energy. As soon as this water is released from the dam, the water flows over the dam. And now the water is in motion. So what is happening here? The potential energy that was present in water before is now being converted or transferred into kinetic energy. There's no new energy that is being created. Only thing that's happening here is that potential energy of water is now converted into kinetic energy. Okay. For instance, if we talk about identify the energy in each example as potential or kinetic, anything that's in motion is kinetic. Anything that is still is potential. Rollerblading meaning something is in motion, so this is kinetic energy. A peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It's steady, right? It is not moving. There's no motion here, which means this is potential energy. Why? Because of its chemical composition. Mowing the lawn, something's moving, so it's kinetic energy. Gasoline in the gas tank. It is still, it is not burning, nothing's happening to it, which means it is potential energy. Okay? The next thing we'll talk about is heat. Heat is also a form of energy. This is the energy which is associated with movement of particles, which means the faster the particles move, the greater is the heat or the thermal energy of that substance. So if we are heating, let's say if I have a pan filled up with water and I heat this water up, what would happen? I'm providing it with more energy. Heat is another form of energy. As I'm giving it more energy, the water molecules start moving around much more rapidly they have much more energy now to move around so heat is associated with movement of particles higher the temperature higher is the heat more would be the movement of particles given an ice cube as heat is added the water molecules that were moving slowly now increase their motion so in ice the solid remember the solids in case of solid, the molecules are very closely, compactly packed around each other. They don't have much space, so they are not moving. But now if I give some more heat into this ice, the water molecules will have more energy. They'll start moving around. Now to move around, they need more space. So what do they do? They convert from solid into liquid. Because liquid will have more space. Not a lot, but there would still be some more space. Right? Now if I give it even more energy, what would happen? It will convert into gas, which would have a lot more space. The particles would have a lot more energy. They'll move around even more. So as you give more heat objects, particles in the objects essentially move faster. That is called thermal energy. Now, what are the different units of energy? Energy can be measured in or expressed in units uh, 
multiple units. One of the units, which is the SI unit, is called joules. It's pronounced as joules. Joules can also be sometimes, joules is a very small energy unit, so it can usually be written as, uh, expressed as kilojoules. Kilo, again, is the same conversion factor. It is 10 raised to power 3. So 1 kilojoule is equal to 1,000 joules. The other unit of energy is calories. Remember, this is written in small CAL. Everything is written in small. So calories can also be expressed as kilocalories, which is 1 kilocalorie would be 1,000 calories. Again, it's a conversion factor of 1,000. The other very commonly used, uh, uh, this commonly used con uh, energy, which is calories, can be related to joules. Okay? What is the definition of calorie? Calorie is defined as the amount of energy that is needed to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So the amount of heat energy that is needed to increase temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius is one calorie. And that can be related to joules by this conversion factor where one calorie is 4.184 joules. So if the energy is given to us in calories, we can convert that into joules and vice versa. For instance, let's say if you're working on this question, how many calories are obtained from a pat of butter if it provides 150 joules of energy when metabolized? So this is the energy in joules. The question is asking what is the energy in calories? So the question is basically asking us to go from joules to calories. Do we have a conversion factor that directly relates it? Yes. We know that one calorie is equal to 4.184 joules. So we'll start with what's given to us, which is joules. So 150 joules. And now I want to cancel joules and convert it into calories. So we divide by joules to cancel joules and multiply by the other unit, which is calorie. Plug in the numbers. One calorie is 4.184 joules. Joules and joules got cancelled. Our final answer is in calories. Now, if you solve for this, it would give you, if you plug this into your calculator, it would give you 35.8608 calories. Now, what do we want our final answer to be in? Remember, this is what's given to us in question. 150. How many sig figs are present in 150? It is two sig figs, right? Remember the zero that are on the right side are not counted until unless there is a decimal place. So this sig figs is two. How many sig figs does this have? The conversion factor? We don't care. It's an exact number. So we don't care about sig figs. The total number of sig figs that we want in our final answer is two. So it has to stop one, two, right here. The next following digit is 8, which is greater than 5. So we will round this number up to 36 calories. And that would be our final answer. Okay, moving on. Uh, we'll continue to energy and nutrition. Another thing that we have seen is sometimes if we are climbing, let's say we are going on a hike, initially we have a lot of energy. So we are converting all that energy that we have, potential energy in us, into kinetic energy. At some point, you lose that energy and you sit down you stop walking what do we do we eat to gain energy we eat some food right so food basically supplies us energy so energy can be related to nutrition most of the times our food labels show us energy in nutritional calories okay make sure you understand this difference the energy unit that we saw before was calories which is small c a l the nutritional calorie is usually written with a capital C. So if you see something written as capital C-A-L, that is, we are talking about energy in uh, the food, nutritional energy, okay? So one calorie in nutritional calorie is equal to 1,000 calories in small. So remember that, okay? The, that's why I was telling you that small C-A-L in capital C-A-L is very different. When we say C-A-L in caps, that is, nutritional energy and when we are talking about small cl we are just talking about the normal unit of energy which is one gram of uh, uh, water to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree celsius that is small calories so one calorie capital calorie is equal to one kilo calorie okay so these are the conversion factors that can be used for converting between nutritional calories and the normal energy unit of calories 
Now, how do people know when you see these food food labels? They say, uh, okay, one serving size would uh, produce this much of these many calories of energy, right? 130 calories of energy. How do they know that? To understand that or to calculate that, people use an instrument which is called a calorie meter. Calorie stands for the calories and meter stands for measurement. So a me instrument that can measure the amount of energy in nutritional calories, okay? And the, what do they do? They basically simply burn the food in this device, which is called calorimeter. It is used to measure the heat that is transferred. It consists of essentially this. It is a container. Uh, it's an insulated container, which consists of the steel combustion chamber and in here, you basically take your food sample. Outside of this container is filled up with water. And uh, there are, this is the ignition wires. And this is the stirrer, which basically is changing or helping in stirring the water that is around this small little chamber. There's a thermometer connected to it, which would tell you what is the temperature of water as the process is going on. So what is done here is we take the sample of food, it's placed inside, we record the initial temperature of water right now, and then what will happen, we'll combust this food using these ignition wires. You heat this food, you burn the food. As the food burns, it produces heat. And what happens to that heat? That is absorbed by water. Since this container is insulated, no heat is lost to outside of this container. All the heat is absorbed by water. As water absorbs heat, its temperature increases and you record the new temperature or the final temperature of water when all the food is burned. That temperature, the change or the difference in the temperature of water can be used to calculate how much heat is released from the burning of this food. And that would tell you how many calories of heat was released. Okay? And to do that, we'll see how you can basically uh, but before that, let's see what people have figured out. People have figured out the caloric food values or the energy value, which is produced from one gram of food. Okay, This is the typical energy value that is produced by one gram of food. So if we consume one gram or burn one gram of carbohydrate, it produces four kilocalories of energy. One gram of fat produces nine kilocalories of energy and one gram of protein produces four kilocalories of energy. The same energy can be converted to kilojoules. This per gram essentially means one gram produces four kilocalories. So if I write four kilocalories per gram, that means one gram of food is going to produce four kilocalories of energy. So this is now your conversion factor. Again, to go from carbohydrate, grams of carbohydrate to energy. Right, so if I say I have 10 grams of carbohydrate, today I consumed 10 grams of carbohydrate. How much of energy did I, that carbohydrate is going to produce? You start with what you have, which is 10 grams of carbohydrate. And how much energy? We basically are going to go from grams to kilocalories. I want to cancel grams, so I'll divide by grams, multiply by kilocalories. One gram, four kilocalories. And remember this, we are talking about carbs. So this is all about carbs. This would produce 40 kilocalories of energy. So again, these basically are your conversion factors that you could use, okay? For instance, if you have, how many calories are obtained from a pat of butter? Oh, we just did that, Never mind. Okay, now the question is asking to convert two to five kilocalories to joules. So it's asking to convert kilocalories to joules do we have a direct conversion factor that relates cal kilocalories to joules we don't what we have is to go from calories to joules which means if i can figure out calories i can convert it into joules what's given to me is kilocalories do i know a conversion factor to go from kilocalories to calories yes kilo is always 1000 so one one kilocalorie is equal to 1000 calories and one calorie, the second conversion factor is one calorie is 4.184 joules. So basically, this is our conversion solution map for this particular conversion. Okay, so we'll go from what's given to what's needed. Let's start with what's given, which is 2 to 5 kilocalories. So you do 2 to 5 
kilocalories. I want to kilo ca cancel the kilocalories, so I divide by kilocalories, convert it into the another unit, which is my first conversion, which is small calories, so small calories. One kilo is 1,000 calories. Again, you don't have to remember this. You can just simply plug in the numbers that you see. One kilo and 1,000 cal. Kilo is canceled. I have my answer in cal, which is right here. Now I move on to the next step in my map, which is to go from small calories. So to cancel small cal, I divide by small cal, multiply with the other side of the conversion factor, which is joules. Joules, one, plug in the numbers, 4.184. Small cal, small cal is canceled. Our final answer is in joules. So this would give you your final answer as joules. Now, if you plug this into your calculator, that would give you 941400 joules, okay? Now, we come to sig figs. How many sig figs do we have in our question? One, two, three. This is three sig figs. How about this? We don't care. It's an exact number. How about this? Again, we don't care. It's an exact number. So, the final answer we want is three sig figs, which means one, two, three. The answer has to end right here. The following number is four, which is um, smaller than five. So no rounding up. We'll leave the number as nine, four, one, zero, zero, zero. Okay. Don't forget to con just include these zeros because this is 941,400. So you cannot just round it down to 941. It would be 941,000. If this is confusing, you could also give the final answer as the um, scientific notation so scientific notation would be my decimal right now there's no decimal here right so if assuming there's a decimal here i'm going to move this up from here to one two three four five so one two three four five places which means it would be 9.41 times 10 with to power five i moved it five places one two three four five five joules that would also be regarded as your final answer. Both are correct. As long as you do not put a decimal here, none of these zeros are significant. So this would also have four, three sig figs. Same thing here. This also has three sig figs. Okay. All right. Next, we go to how is energy involved in chemical and physical changes? Okay. So chemical reactions happen most readily when energy is released during the reaction. Okay? Molecules with a lot of chemical potential energy are less stable than ones with less chemical potential energy. So molecules with a lot of chemical potential energy are less stable, which means higher the energy, less stable are the molecules. You can just think in terms of if we have more energy, we are not stable. We are moving around, we are jumping around. So everything in this universe essentially wants to have less energy possible to be in a more stable state. Energy is usually released when reactants have more chemical potential energy than products. So that essentially means usually in a reaction, energy is released. It's not very important. It doesn't happen all the time. It is not necessary. Okay, But sometimes energy is released. Sometimes in a chemical reaction, energy is absorbed processes can be regarded as an exothermic process or an endothermic process okay when a chemical reaction or a chemical change results in release of energy the reaction or the process is called an exothermic process okay which means that here the reactants so what is happening in a reaction the reactants are getting converted into products so the question the What's happening here? The reactants have high energy and products have less energy. Again, remember energy cannot be created or destroyed. If this has high energy and this has low energy, when this occurs, when reactants are converted into products, that excess energy has to be also released. Okay, you cannot just forget about that. If this reactant has 50 joules of energy and products have let's say 40 joules of energy, that extra 10 joules of energy will be released as energy. Okay, You cannot just forget about that. That means in this reaction, energy will be 
released as one of the products. So such reactions are called exothermic reactions. Okay. On the other hand, for instance, you can see right here, if uh, when we burn gas, for instance, methane, you know, if you're using, that's a chemical reaction that is on, happens in our stovetop. We have methane gas, which is released from our stove. When we light fire to it, it catches fire. It's combusting. So during this process, this is a chemical reaction. During this process, energy is released as heat, and that is what we use to cook our food with, because that heat energy is then used to cook our food. So this is an example of an exothermic reaction. If this is the reaction, where reactants are getting converted into products, energy is released and that energy is given to our surroundings. Okay. So if we were to draw the energy diagram for an exothermic reaction, this is how it would look like. If on y-axis I have potential energy, the energy is low here and as we are going up, the potential energy is increasing. So you can see products have low energy, reactants have high energy. So as the reaction is going on, reactant are going to convert into products and the amount that is difference in the energy would be released. That is an exothermic reaction. On the other hand, an endothermic process or an endothermic reaction is where energy is absorbed during the reaction. So in this case, the reactants have less energy than the products. So the reactants will absorb energy to be converted into products. For instance, when we are using a cold pack, our hand feels hot. Oh, sorry, our hand feels cold. Why is that? Because this reaction that is happening in this cold pack requires energy. Which, where, where is it going to get the energy from? From the surroundings. So if this is our reaction, for instance, in this case, this cold pack is our reaction. The reaction requires energy, so it is going to absorb energy from where? From the surroundings this hand our hand is essentially our the surrounding so when this reaction in the cold pack happens it absorbs the heat or energy from our hand and that's why our hand feels cold so in this case if we are drawing the energy diagram the reactants have low energy products have high energy as the reactants get converted into product they have to have more energy they need to get more energy from somewhere and they get it from the surrounding so they absorb the excess energy as any form of energy okay? and this a reaction is called an endothermic reaction or an endothermic process okay next we'll talk about another uh, very important concept which is called specific heat as we are talking about energy we need to understand what is specific heat so different substances have different specific heat or specific heat capacity what does that mean this is the amount of heat that is needed to raise temperature of exactly one gram of a substance by exactly one degree celsius so the amount of heat that is needed to raise temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree celsius is called its specific heat capacity meaning if i need to heat up of one what one gram of water by one degree celsius i need to supply it some energy and that energy is called specific heat capacity the unit for that is in joules per gram degree celsius this is the commonly used unit for specific heat capacity it can also be written as calories per gram degree celsius and you know the conversion factor between joules and calories already okay specific heat capacity of water is 4.184 4.184 joules per gram per degree celsius that means that we need to give 4.184 grams joules of heat to one gram of water to change its temperature by one degree celsius this is a very high specific heat capacity for instance if you um, supply let's say i supply 10 joules of energy to uh, one gram of water and 10 joules of energy to one gram of iron metal which one will get more heated up water will be less hot and uh, which one would be at higher temperature water would be lesser temperature and iron would have a much higher temperature why because specific heat capacity of water is very high this you give it the same amount of energy the temperature change for water is much less than the iron 
or some other metal. So for instance, you can see right here, these are some uh, specific heat capacities shown to you. For instance, aluminum is this, copper is this, and uh, different forms, right? Different metals, these are different compounds. And you can see right here, water, when liquid has a very high specific heat capacity. It is one calorie for per gram degree Celsius or 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. So you need to give water 4.184 joules of energy to change its temperature by one degree Celsius. But for aluminum, you just have to give it 0 0.897 joules of energy to change its temperature by one degree Celsius. So basically the same amount of energy is going to raise the temperature of aluminum by a lot more than water. That is why water is usually used as a coolant in our cars because it can absorb a lot more heat and still keep the temperature low. Okay, now another thing that we uh, that you saw in the previous slide was this particular formula, which is Q is equal to MC delta T. So we saw that C right here is the specific heat capacity. This is given by Q equals MC delta T. Here Q is the heat, M is the mass of the object, C is the specific heat capacity of that particular object, and delta T is the temperature change. This is basically showing you that amount of heat energy which is gained or lost by an object depends on the mass of the object, which means higher the mass, higher would be the amount of heat that would be needed to change its temperature, right? C is the specific heat capacity and delta T is the temperature change that would happen. So basically heat of gained by an object or heat lost by an object depends on three factors. It's mass, it's heat capacity and it's temperature change. And the relationship that relates all of them is this, Q equals MC delta T. So we can use this. Um, equation to basically calculate how much heat is needed to heat up an object and to change its temperature. For instance, let's see, questions could be like this. What is the specific heat capacity if 24.8 grams of a metal absorbs 275 joules of energy and the temperature rises from 20.2 degrees Celsius to 24.5 degrees Celsius? So the question is asking, what is the specific heat capacity of this particular object, meaning what is C? So what is the C of this object? That is what the question is asking. If 24.8 grams of metal, which means what's given to us is mass of the metal is 24.8 grams. First, always write down what's given to you. It absorbs 275 joules of energy, which means this is heat, energy, energy, heat, Heat energy lost or gained does not matter. This is the change in energy that is happening. So 275 joules. And the temperature rises from 22.2 degrees Celsius to 24.5 degrees Celsius. So that means that is the, that would tell us temperature change. So 20.2 20 degrees Celsius is the initial temperature, which is Ti is 22.2 degrees celsius because it's tell it is the question is telling us the temperature is rising from this to this two is basically a final temperature so temperature final is 24.5 degree celsius the question is asking what is c do we know a relationship that relates mass heat and temperature and c yes we know that q is equal to mc delta t this triangle that you see right here in front of temperature is usually referred to as delta. And this, that's why I'm calling this as delta T, which means this is change in temperature. Change in temperature would always be final temperature minus initial temperature. So delta T here is change in temperature, final minus initial. Do we have mass given to us in this question? Yes. Do we have Q given to us in this question? Yes. Do we have C given to us in this question? No, that is what the question is asking us. Do we have delta T given to us in question? No, but the question is giving us final temperature and initial temperature so I can solve for delta T. So technically, no, but I can solve for it. 
So basically everything in this equation is given to us except C and we are solving for C. So first thing we can plug in all the values here. We can say that Q is 275 joules equals M which is 24.8 grams times C which I'm solving for times T which is temperature change which would be in parentheses temperature change would be final minus initial so final is 24.5 degrees celsius minus initial is 20.2 degrees celsius so this is my equation now i would rearrange this equation to solve for c if i'm solving for c i need everything else to be on the other side of the equal sign so how can i do that i'll divide both the sides by 24.8 and this whole thing temperature change right if you solve for this temperature change I'll solve for it separately so I can easily divide this if you plug this into your calculator 24.5 minus 20.2 remember always solve for parentheses first this would give you 4.3 degree Celsius okay and do not solve for the uh, number of six weeks until you come to the final answer. Remember, do not round it up or round it down. How many six weeks should this have? This should have one. This is a question of subtraction, right? Addition, subtraction, we use decimal places. This first value has one decimal place. Second has one decimal place. So our final answer should have one decimal place. So the final answer should be right here. So this part will regard it as it would have two six weeks, okay? Next, we'll solve for C now. So if I want to solve for C, I have to divide both the sides by 24.8 grams and 4.3 degrees Celsius. Again, you can't do it on one side. You have to do it on both the sides. So I divide this side also by 24.8 grams and 4.3 degree Celsius. This and this got canceled along with the units. This and this whole temperature thing got canceled along with the units. What am I left with? C, which means C is this. So if you plug this into your calculator, now this would give you a value of, I have 2.57876. This is what my calculator gives me. How many sig figs? Now let's decide that. So how many sig figs did the question give us in this number? This number is three sig figs. This number, 24.8, is three sig figs. 4.3 right here we found out that this should have two six figs how because we just did this that it should end at three so this would have two six figs so this right here is two six figs now our final answer should have how many six figs two six figs the least number of six figs this is a multiplication question now multiplication and division the least number of six figs is two so my final answer should stop right here the following digit is seven which is greater than five which means I will round this number up to 2.6. And what is the units? Don't forget the units. This is joules per gram degree Celsius. So that would be my final answer. C is equal to 2.6 joules per gram degree Celsius. And you can see that from the units, you'll get the right answer. Okay. Moving on. The question can also be in this form. The question could be, you guys can try this question out yourself. It's based on the same concept. I'll give you the idea or the planning to solve it, and then you can work through the question yourself. The answer is also given to you in the slide. Calculate the amount of heat needed to raise temperature of 2.5 grams of gallium. C is given to a C is specific heat capacity, and temperature is changing from 25.0 to 29.9 degrees Celsius. So what is the question asking? Calculate the amount of heat needed, which means the question is asking what is Q. So we are solving for Q. What's given to us in question M, which is 2.5 grams of gallium, meaning the mass. Grams is unit for mass. So M is given to us here. C is given to us right here. This is specific heat capacity. And this is the initial temperature, 25 degrees Celsius, because the question is saying the temperature is raising from 25 to 29. So this is initial and 29.9 degrees Celsius is our final temperature. So now Q is what? Q is MC delta T. I can solve for delta T. Delta T would be, let's plug it in all here. Temp mass is 
sorry mass is 2.5 grams c is this 0 0.372 joules per gram degree celsius right and t is delta t would be final minus initial so 29.9 degree celsius minus 25.0 degree celsius now if you work with the units you'll see grams and grams got cancelled degree celsius and degree celsius here would get cancelled and we will be left only with joules so now you can just plug this into your calculator okay if you are trying to solve this how would we do this we'll first solve for the parentheses remember that okay so this would give us 2.5 times 0 0.372 joules times this if you solve for this value right here it would give you final minus initial is 4.9 okay this gives you 4.9 degrees celsius now we worry about sig figs how many sig figs did this have two how about this this is specific heat capacity this has three sig figs this has two sig figs and this right here is based on addition subtraction so this has one decimal place one decimal place so our final answer should have one decimal place so this has two sig figs so this was two this was three so how many sig figs do we want in our final answer two the least number of sig figs right so our final answer if you plug this into your calculator it would give you 4.557 joules okay degree celsius sorry degree celsius we got cancelled it before so cancel that okay this would give you these many joules of energy now a final answer should have two six figs which means it should end right here so next following digit is five which is equal to five so we will round the number before it which would make it 4.6 joules so that would be our final answer okay moving on to the next question the third kind of question you could get here is a 328 gram of water absorbs this many joules of heat so this is giving you mass first step we have mass given to us this is the amount of heat given to us so this is q calculate the change in temperature for water so the question is asking what is delta t calculate that and then it says if water is initially 25 degrees celsius what is the final temperature okay so if initially it is this what is the final temperature so it's also asking us to calculate what is the final temperature and specific heat capacity for water is given to us so this is small c we know that q is equal to mc delta t so first thing first step is solve for delta t q was given to us just plug in the values 5.78 times 10 raised to power 3 joules equal m is 328 grams times c is 4.184 joules per gram degree celsius do not forget the units always include the units in your question in your also in your equation so you can solve for the correct answer you can confirm that if your units are coming out to be correct your answer is probably correct now to calculate delta t i want delta t on one side of the equal and rest everything else should be on the other side which means i'm going to divide both the sides by 328 grams so 328 grams and by 4.184 4.184 joules per gram degree celsius 4.184 joules per gram degree celsius this and this would get cancelled along with units this and this would get cancelled along with all the units right degree celsius degree celsius joules and grams now what's left here these grams and these grams would get cancelled right and this joule and this joule would get cancelled what are we left with we are left with the numbers and one over degree celsius so this if you think about this this is basically first let's solve for the number if you solve for plug in the numbers into your calculator this is now delta t that's it 
this would give you plugging in all the numbers in calculator would give you four point it's a very big number it is four point two one one um seven four something something okay we don't care what's happening afterwards so now this is basically all the units are cancelled divided by one over degree celsius right this this is one over degree celsius which means this is basically degree celsius over one same thing okay so now this temperature difference is essentially degree celsius 4.211 now how many sig figs this let's do the sig figs first this has three sig figs 5.78 is three 328 is three 4.184 is four and we are doing multiplication division so eventually we want least number of sig figs which is three so it has to end right here so our delta t is going to be equal to 4.21 degree celsius and the following digit is one so we do not round it up now that is the first part the next question was if water is initially 25.0 what is the final temperature so we know that delta t equals t final minus t initial delta t we know so let's plug in the values here delta t is 4.21 degree celsius is equal to final which we want to calculate minus initial is 25.0 degree celsius so now if i rearrange this i want tf on one side everything else on the other side to get everything else on the other side i will here 25 is subtracted so i'll add 25.0 degree celsius on both these sides right and finally this and this would get cancelled they'll give me zero so tf plus zero would be tf so i'm left with tf on one side and this would give you final answer as 29.21 degree celsius now what how many sig figs do we want in our final answer so let's work on sig figs now this is addition question so in case of addition we look for decimal places how many decimal places does this have two decimal places this has this number has one decimal place so we are going to go with the least decimal place which is one so my final answer should end right here which means our final answer would be tf equals 29.2 degree celsius so that would be our final answer for this question okay next we'll talk about different states of matter and their changes or the processes uh, between different changes of states of matter. So whenever the, we saw previously that the three different states of matter that exist are solid, liquid, and gas. So whenever these states change within each other, the, basically the physical state of matter changes, each of these state change is called a different process and has a different terminology. So you guys should be familiar with these terminology the easiest way is you take example of water so solid water is ice liquid water right whenever solid ice melts into liquid we call that ice is melting so the process of conversion of solid into liquid is called melting and the reverse is called freezing i'm taking the example of water here because it's easy but the this terminology applies to any single chemical process physical process this is a physical change any single um, if any solid is converting into liquid that process would be called melting now if we talk about energy in this process whenever melting happens you can think of this heat will be added up heat is used in this process whenever something freezes when liquid is changing to solid heat will be lost so it is negative heat heat is lost in this process now if a liquid is converting into gas that process is called evaporation and the reverse where gas is converted into liquid is called condensation so if liquid is changing into gas heat will be used up in the process and the reverse heat will be released same thing when solid is directly converted into gas so there is no liquid in between this process is called sublimation and this again would use some heat Whereas the reverse, where gas is directly converted into solid, that process is called deposition. And in this case, heat will be released. So negative. Heat is released in this 
process. Okay, so you should be familiar with this terminology. Now, this is again telling you the same thing, except whenever a substance is melting, it changes from solid to liquid at a particular temperature. And that temperature is called the melting point of that particular substance. And the temperature when something freezes is called its freezing point. So basically water has a melting point or a freezing point of zero degree Celsius. Because this same process is going to happen at the same temperature, right? If I change the temperature higher than zero, it's going to melt. If I change the temperature lower than zero, it is going to freeze. So zero is the temperature where ice melts, where water basically melts or water freezes. This heat that is involved in this process of melting or freezing is called the heat of fusion. Heat of fusion is the amount of heat which is released when one gram of liquid freezes or the amount of heat needed when one gram of solid melts. So during the process of melting or freezing, the amount of heat change that happens is called the heat of fusion. Heat is released during freezing and heat is needed during melting. The important thing is that the amount of heat that is needed or released during these processes is going to be always equal to each other. Okay. Same thing, next step is sublimation, deposition. Again, the process is sublimation or deposition and it happens again at one particular temperature. Okay. For instance, in this case, the example is given to you for dry ice. Sublimation happens at minus 78 degrees Celsius. What is dry ice? Dry ice is solid CO2. So CO2 is the gas, carbon dioxide, right? That can be solidified by directly into, gas can be converted into solid CO2, which is dry ice. And this process is called deposition. This happens for CO2, it happens at minus 78 degrees Celsius. Okay, now one thing that in um, when we talk about evaporation and boiling, those are two different things. Okay, evaporation essentially is a process where solid, uh, sorry, liquid is converted into gas. So let's say if I have some water in here, how is water going to vaporize? Evaporation happens at every single temperature, right? We say some days are more humid than some other days. Why is that? Because some days there is more water or more moisture in the air. Where is that moisture? Which means that there is always some moisture present in the air, right? Which means there's always some water which is present in the gaseous form at every single temperature. So if you put a glass of water outside, even if that water is present at like, let's say 25 degrees Celsius, some water would evaporate. It will be a very slow process, but it will turn into gas and vaporize, right? What happens in evaporation? The liquid molecules that are present on the surface of the liquid, at some point, they gain enough energy that they turn from liquid into gas, right? But what happens when we boil a liquid? Boiling essentially means we are heating liquid from we are providing heat to this liquid from outside. When liquid is heated, all the molecules in the liquid now have more energy. Okay, So it is basically any molecule from this liquid can have enough energy to vaporize. And that process is called boiling. That's when things bubble, liquids bubble, because now the molecule that was at the bottom is going to turn into gas. In evaporation, only the molecule that is on the surface of the liquid and uh, air interface is going to vaporize. So that is the difference between evaporation. This is evaporation where only the top molecule, which is on the top layer, is going to vaporize at any temperature. Boiling means it is going to happen at the boiling point or melting point or, uh, sorry, not melting, the boiling point of that particular liquid. So it has to be something, it can be any molecule from the middle, from the outside, it will have enough, any molecule that has enough energy to turn from liquid to gas is going to turn into vapors. Okay. That is why we see bubbles when something vaporizes. And the process, the heat that is involved in this process of vaporization, meaning or condensation is called the heat of vaporization. It is essentially the heat 
that is absorbed to change 1 gram of liquid to gas at its boiling point or when 1 gram of gas is turned into liquid at its boiling point. So vaporization, condensation, whatever is the heat change, that is called the heat of vaporization. How can the question be asked? Something like this. How many joules are needed to melt 32 grams of ice at 0 degrees Celsius? Heat of fusion for water is 334 joules per gram. So the question is asking how many joules, so what is the joules that is needed to melt 32 grams of ice? So mass of ice is given to us 32.0 grams at 0 degrees Celsius. And heat of fusion is given to us, which is 334 joules per gram. Now, whenever heat of fusion or heat of vaporization is given to you, always use that as a conversion factor. The question is asking, essentially, if I have 32 grams of uh, ice, how much heat will be released when this ice melts? So we basically have to go from grams to joules, right? The question is asking to go from grams to joules. Do I have a conversion factor that goes from grams to joules? Yes. Always use the heat of fusion, heat of vaporization. If it is given to you in question, use it as a conversion factor. Here it is telling me 334 joules per gram. That means I can rewrite this as a conversion factor, which means 334 joules of heat is released from 1 gram of water that melts or 1 gram of ice that melts. It's saying heat of fusion for water, right? So whenever water melts or condenses, 1 gram of it is going to release 334 joules of heat. So basically this fraction that is given to you, convert that into a conversion factor. 334 joules per gram, meaning no number is written, that means it is 1 gram. So now we have a conversion factor to go directly from grams to joules. So we'll use that here. Start with what's given, which is 32.0 grams. I want to convert grams to joules, so I cancel the grams, I divide by grams, multiply by the other factor, which is joules, which is right here. Now just plug in the number, 1 gram, 3, 3, 4 joules, so gram and gram got cancelled, your final answer is in joules. Okay, and how many sig figs do we want in our final answer? This is multiplication. This right here has three sig figs. This right here has three sig figs, so our final answer should have three sig figs. Okay, if you solve for this using your calculator, you will get a final answer as this right here, 10700. Zero, zero, zero. And how many sig figs does this have? Three sig figs. One, two, three. All these following zeros on the right side are not significant until unless there is a decimal. So if you don't include a decimal, you're fine. Okay. There's one more question for you guys that you can practice on your own. Um, the solution is already given to you in slide. So you can pause the video right here and try to practice this question by yourself. Okay. And then you can check your final answer. Okay. I'll move on to the next concept, which is the last idea in this change of state, which is called a heating curve or a cooling curve. Okay, Heating curve or cooling curve essentially means, let's say if I'm starting right here, you can see this on the x-axis, I have heat, which is being added to the reaction. And on the left y-axis, I have temperature change. So what is happening here? This is a heating curve for water. You're starting with solid, water which is ice we're heating it up it melts turns into liquid and then it boils and turns into gas so this is a heating curve for heating of water what is happening here heating curve will always consist of some slant lines and some plateaus okay like this straight lines which is plateau so initially what is happening you take with solid ice let's say the ice temperature was minus 40 we know that ice melts at zero degrees celsius so what do we have to do first? We add heat to this ice until it reaches 0 degree Celsius, right? Temperature is on y-axis. This is 0. So until it comes to 0 degree Celsius, we are adding heat or we are adding energy. You see right here, it changes from here to here. So we are adding some heat. It turned into, it reached 0 degree Celsius. That is the temperature where all the ice is going to melt. So even if I give it more heat, you can see the heat initially was this at zero degree and finally it is at this. So this much heat was given to ice to melt. 
so you can see right here what is happening the temperature of the ice while ice is melting is not changing so this is called the plateau during the slant range what is happening we are giving the heat into the system and it is absorbing the heat so this is where temperature is changing the slant are the places where temperature changes and plateaus are the places where the physical state changes so the state changed from solid to liquid and then we gave it some more heat so now all that heat that was given is changing this is where the liquid has turned right this is solid to liquid so this is where the liquid starts now when i give it more heat it is going to use that heat energy to increase the temperature from 0 degree celsius to 100 degree celsius which is the boiling point of water once all the liquid reaches 100 degree celsius it will start boiling and it will boil until all of the liquid has converted into water vapor or steam okay so this process is boiling where all the liquid is converting into gas and the important thing here is you can see this is a plateau region meaning the temperature here is not changing you can give you're starting from this much heat and going till this much heat so you're giving it a lot of heat but all that heat is only used for boiling or changing the physical state the temperature is not changing during this process and then once it's turned into gas you can give it more heat what would happen to that heat that would be used to increase the temperature of the steam map. okay so basically in case of heating or cooling curves you would see that the slanting regions are telling us that the temperature is changing and the plateau regions basically tell us that the physical state is changing so when you're boiling water water boils at 100 degrees celsius meaning until all the water has boiled and turned into gas the temperature is not going to change from the first drop of liquid to the last drop of liquid the temperature will be 100 degrees celsius similarly when ice is formed when freezing happens or melting is happening the temperature will always be zero degrees celsius until everything is converted from one state to other next you can see here the example of cooling curve cooling curve is exactly opposite it starts from high we are starting with steam it is cooling so temperature is changing once it reaches 100 this is the condensation process where gas will be turned into liquid and temperature will stay constant because this is the change of physical state once the temperature has once the state has changed now all the heat will be released until the temperature comes back down from 100 to zero once it is zero the temperature will stay constant until everything is turned from liquid to solid ice and again once the state has changed the temperature will again start changing okay so a plateau on a heating curve represents what it represents a temperature change a constant temperature or a change of state it represents change of state and a constant temperature right plateau means the temperature is not changing and the state is changing what does a slope line on a heating curve represent a slope means this whenever there is a change an angle okay a slope line on a heating curve represents a temperature change yes because this is temperature right this axis is temperature so if there is a slope that means temperature is changing from here to here a constant temperature no a change of state no a change of state is plateau okay so that is the kind of questions you can expect from here and this i think is the last topic we'll cover in this chapter so feel free to ask any questions if you have uh, you can email me and uh, let me know if you run into any issues